candle. What put it this way, what was the market maker getting into? What was the market maker getting into here? The market maker was getting short at a lower price. Why would the market maker get short at a lower price? Why would a market maker ever get short at a lower price? The market maker model is normally getting short at a higher price. Why would the market maker get short at a lower price and offer buyers a better deal? Why would the market maker offer a buyer a better deal on their off on their trade? Why would a market maker get short on a downtick? Anyone? Because they're bearish, okay? Because they're bearish. So what's going to happen to this trade? The price, this is a high probability squeeze of this paycheck liquidity at the bottom edge now, isn't it? High probability squeeze. Perhaps it might take this liquidity here, but it's a high probability squeeze for $100. What happens next? Boom. You see how high probability that was? Now, why was that a high probability trade? Because every time a seller comes in, the market maker was withdrawing their liquidity. So if I look at all the big selling deltas, if I look at all the big deltas on this chart, do you see that the big deltas make the market maker pull their liquidity? Look, market maker pulls their liquidity to the very, very lowest price possible so that they don't get trapped on a trade. Okay? Then they got another big delta and another big down candle so that they don't get trapped on the trade. So when you see this happening, you know that the market maker must have detected commercial selling at these prices up here. You must have detected the selling at these prices, yeah? The market maker must have done that because otherwise that selling would have been an absolute gift for the market maker to say, give me some. But guess what? This trade started ages ago. This trade started earlier than this. If I go back further, do you see the big selling delta with the big down move in the candle? Look, do you see it? Do you see the big selling delta? You see the big imbalance of sellers coming in here? So there must be a commercial seller here because why would the market maker withdraw the liquidity so much if they were bullish? The answer is they wouldn't. So they're therefore reading this big delta here and the market maker's response to that big delta tells me that the market maker is bearish. Or rather the market maker might not be bearish, but the market is definitely bearish. So it's not about the delta that's important, it's about the reaction to the delta that's important, isn't it? So one of the things we know is that there's a commercial seller up here because the market maker's pulled, and the commercial seller's coming in below $53 barrel oil. So if we know there's a commercial seller coming in below $53, well, we know it's going to go to $52.50 because that's where the next wholesale price level is going to be. So when we see that, we can start selling to try and get $52.50 oil, perhaps even $52 oil, perhaps even $51.50 oil. But we would have to see what happens when we get to those key wholesale price areas where market makers and commercials will both be looking for business. So when we look at this, you can see that that selling does come in. Look at this. Look at the withdrawal of liquidity. Look, small deltas, but the market maker is still pulling it as far and as fast as they possibly can, and they're always loading the volume at the bottom of the candle. That means there's still a lot of commercial selling coming in here, isn't there? There's still, and there she goes, look, boom. A lot of commercial selling still coming in. The market maker is withdrawing liquidity to the bottom of the candle. They must still be bearish. That's why when we go back to something like price action or, or profile, and we ask the question, what is this candle, bullish or bearish? When we ask the question, what is this candle, if I was to draw a candle from an open high, low, close situation, is this bullish or bearish? And the candle looks a little bit like this in terms of the profile in the candle. 
the candle looks perhaps a little bit like this. Think about the market maker. Think about the fact that if that's got a heavy sell side delta, all of that volume is here. So the market maker must have been you know, concerned about that selling to pull the liquidity as low as possible before they start taking some of that selling on the book. And obviously that tells me that the next trade is probably, we've got the taper up here, the next trade is probably still sell side, isn't it? It's probably still sell side, unless they trap that. But in, if, if they're going to trap that, what's the candle more likely to look like? Okay, we'll do the same size candle. And we'll draw the same profile. Hopefully, knowing what I'm going to be showing you here, we'll draw the same profile in the candle, approximately. Okay, so if the market maker wants to, to now go bullish, what's the candle going to look like? It's the same profile, it's the same POC in the middle, same POC in the middle as this one. Yeah, same, exactly identical, but what's, what's going to be different about this candle here if the market maker is now bullish? Yeah, the price, the close, will probably be back up here, won't it? The close will probably be back up here. Because what's going to happen is the market maker is now going to absorb that. The market maker is now long. Yeah, market maker is now long 10, plus 10 for argument's sake. The market maker is also plus 10 on this one. They're also plus 10 on this one. But on this one, they've actually gone bullish, so they've actually managed to rotate the price back up. And if they wanted to come off the trade, they could now come off the trade for a profit at this close. Now, obviously, if they're really bearish, if they're really bearish, they may well come off the close up here because they've now made a profit. What's going to happen? You'll see a bit of volume coming in here from a short trade because you're now going to see selling coming in here. At, at uh, You're going to see selling still coming in here at minus 10. It's not going to show up as minus 10 deltas, it's going to show up as plus 10, isn't it? And that's a minus 10 for the market maker. So you're going to see plus 10 up here. And a lot of the times, if the market maker is now bearish, that price will open here and do that. Do you see it? Do you see it now, guys? Because obviously, if that happens, the market maker has obviously detected that there's big commercial selling, but because we've now got a candle here with positive deltas and the market makers now used that to trap these guys, then what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next, guys? What's going to happen next? Price will probably do that, wouldn't it? Does everybody agree with that? The price will probably do do that. So when we look at that candle, when we look at that candle here, or this candle here, or this candle here, do you see any of those trades? Do you see any of those trades, guys? If you look at this candle here, do you see that exact trade setting up? Look. Positive deltas, down candle. Positive deltas. I know it's marginal, but it's still green. Positive deltas, down candle. What's going to happen next? The price should sell off. The price sells off. You see it? Positive deltas on a down candle. Why do they keep getting positive deltas on a down candle? Because we've now trapped the volume here and we've now got the profit. Do you see the trapped volume and the profit on each of these trades? Look. So there's all the volume coming in in the trap. There's the volume. Yeah, you can see the big volume. Uh, sorry, the, but the big volume delta is actually in this candle. But um, Okay, so the big volume, that's about a break-even trade, isn't it? You can see the big volume coming in here, 
I can't even show you because it's it's too tight. But anyway, the big volumes are around about 84. And as soon as the price does 88s, we get positive deltas. The trap's now set and the price now breaks. When we get positive deltas, the big volume was here. Now they're making a profit here. The trap's now set, but they're still bearish because the candle has gone down on positive deltas. So we're now expecting this market to break lower again. There she goes. There she goes. And then we do exactly the same here. There's the big positive deltas here. There's the market maker's profit. Positive deltas. That's exactly right. Positive deltas on a down candle. That's correct. So we're now expecting this market to break lower again. Boom. There she goes. You see it? Well, think about this, guys. If you traded each of those, if you traded each of those auctions before she goes and used the market maker's process to try and trade those as, as momentum-based trades based or below the 50 line, below the 50 line, then your first trade would have been a short trade here at 52.80. That would have been your first short trade at 52.80. Your exit would have been on the volume break back to the upside, which would have been around about 52.70. Okay, so that's a plus 10 ticks on that trade. Your next short trade would have been when you saw this uh, positive delta on this down candle with the volume above, so you'd have sold probably about 70, 52.69.70s. 52.69.70s. Your next exit was this volume break back to the upside at 52.50. That's plus 20. Well, that's... $300 on a single contract. That's $300 on a single contract on two trades, uh, which lasted from 1240 to 12 uh, 1259. So about 20 minutes of, of very, very simple order flow trading to make $300 profit. 20 minutes to make $300 profit during that little process of, manip of price manipulation. Because the market maker must still be really worried if they keep pulling the liquidity out to get as low a price as possible. They're obviously not worried as much at this price because they obviously reckon what? The market maker obviously reckons what at this price? That they can, they can make a profit, don't they? And it's not going to take much for the price to rotate back up for the market maker to make a profit on that very large buy trade that they now have on their books. It's only going to take them maybe two or three ticks above that volume for the market maker to make a profit because they got so much volume in this trade here. They got so much volume around about 52.40 that if price trades about 52.41s, 42s, 43s, the market maker will make a killing on that trade. But if they're still bearish, if they're still bearish, they'll take whatever stops that fall out of the book at that stage to get short again. So you'd be looking for exactly the same type of setups in here, and you can see that they are still bearish because the, the, they don't get any net positive deltas, but they certainly don't, they certainly don't get any, any strong move above that. You can see there's a block trade one tick above the volume, so you can see that probably that block trade was a market maker getting off that or getting off some of that trade for a profit of maybe one tick. And the price trades away from it again, off the block volume, and down she goes again. We're now trading at 5210s. We started the selling trade, guys, at 5280s. So imagine you still had a one lot left over from your first sell, and a one lot left over from your second sell. You haven't added to this trade because you didn't get the green deltas on a down candle to get more sells. You're now trading 5210s. You're now trading 5210s. You've just made another $700 on one contract, another $600 on the other contract on a two lot. So all of a sudden, that 30, that $300 profit is now sitting at $1,600 profit on a two lot scalping the oil. And the time period has now went from 12.40 to 13.06. You've now traded 25 minutes. 25 minutes scalping order flow as a momentum trader, based simply on order flow, you've made $1,600 profit on a two lot. Well, some of you might have been sitting yesterday in awe at the interns. Some of you might have been sitting open mouth at the interns. Maybe not in awe, but because it should, you shouldn't be in awe of that situation. But, it, but what I'm saying is, 
a lot of you might be looking at, for example, a profit of a hundred thousand dollars and saying to yourself, hundred, how is it possible? How is it possible to make a hundred thousand dollars in the market by just scalping? I've just showed you that over a 20 minute period here, $1,600 of profits on a two lot. Well, imagine instead of a two lot, you're trading a, a 50 lot, 25 times bigger than that, 25 times $1,600, let's say $2,000, is $50,000 for a small bank desk trader, 50 grand. Yes, it's a good move. I know it's a good move. I'm not arguing that it's a terrible, tiny range and all that kind of stuff. But the point is that when the market does break for you and you can see the market maker's rotations and the market maker auction, the one thing you've got to try and understand is, well, that makes perfect sense. That's a winning trade for me. I can make money on that information so long as I just work it, so long as I get a basic idea. So you can just step into the next trade. You can wait for the next opportunity. You can see the market maker starts to withdraw liquidity on this trade. Now look, the market maker starts to withdraw liquidity on this trade because look at what's happening during this process. You've got a tiny little red delta here on an up candle. So the market maker is getting long at higher prices. Price goes up. See it? Do you see how the market, just, just reading that market maker position, allowed you to see that there was a bottom edge definitely getting put in here because when we saw that red delta on this candle here and it was an up candle you'd have probably have looked at it and says well wait a minute something's changed here the market maker has gone bullish at a higher price because remember the market maker is the opposite of the delta so if the delta is red the market maker is bullish at a higher price that's not normal if the market maker was still really concerned about price moving lower, why would they go bullish at a higher price? Because they're not bearish anymore, are they? They're not bearish. So you're starting to think this this is this looks like a bottom edge, and I know where it is. I know where the volume is. So I know that this is probably a sh maybe a short term bottom edge. It might only last one candle, but as a scalper, I don't really care. I can take advantage of that tiny piece of information, step right into that position, and make myself another $300 on the way back off the bottom edge. Imagine a 20 lot on that $300 trade. Another $6,000 towards your $100,000 target per day for your institutional scalpers. And they're only using between 20, I mean, they, do, they have gone up to 50 lots in the past, guys, 50 lots. But on average, their trade size is between 10 and 20. You've seen some trades going off with ones and threes. So they don't oft, they don't always get into the 20s on these trades. They sometimes end up with ones and twos and three lots, and they make small amounts, and then they just wait for the next opportunity to get a bit, a bit more size into the play. And this is what you're trying to figure out. You're trying to figure this out. Look, now, now you can see what happens here. Something changes here. Look, a green candle red deltas so you're thinking okay well they're they're still involved in this they're still taking long trades but they're now taking long trades down at maybe around about 30 so i'm thinking we're probably going up one because there was a little bit of a there was a little bit of selling coming off of this one tiny amount of selling but the market maker did withdraw quite a sizable amount of liquidity to drop the price down so there's a concern at the moment for a possible short but you can see that that little buy trade here tiny little buy trade just went from 30 to 37, $70, $70, and it took absolutely no time at all. Look, it went from 13.28 to 13.30. Took two minutes, 70 bucks, market maker trade, perfection. Didn't do any more than that, because you can see the market maker takes the opposite view. You can see we've got a green delta on a red candle. What does that tell you? That tells you the market maker is going short at a lower price. Why would the market maker ever go short at a lower price? Because they're obviously now bearish off of that volume there, aren't they, at 35? They're bearish off the volume at 35. So if you were trading that, you would put a sell stop order in at 34, 33. What happens next? Do you see it? Seriously, do you see it?
I can't make these trades up, guys, because they're on your screens. They're on your screens in front of you. So you can see that that 35 short trade just traded 15s. You just made $200 maybe on a 50 lot. That's another 10 grand to the market maker's pot, isn't it? That's that's how you can end up with $100,000 on a single day's trading based on a 20 lot. 100 grand a day, half a million a week based on a 20 lot. 50 grand a week based on a two lot. Um, on that bar, I don't see why the market maker went short, because you've got green deltas. You've just got a tight, I mean, I know it's a tiny green delta, but we're, we've got to use something. And all we're doing is just using the color. If it's a green delta, the market maker must have went short, agreed? Because the market maker doesn't cross the spread. So if the delta is positive, it must mean there was more buy market orders. And if it's a red candle, it must have been at a lower price. The close must have been lower than the open for it to be a red candle. The close must be lower than the open to be a red candle. So the simple narrative is that the market maker went short on a down candle. If the, mark, if the simple narrative is that the market maker went short on a down candle, what the hell are they up to? Why are they offering the buyers a good price? Because the buyers got a lower price for their buy trade, didn't they? If the buyer op if the if if the initial price was if the initial price on this candle was 35 and the buyer came in and bought one, and the buyer came in and bought a second contract and they got 34, the buyers got a lower price. The deltas are positive, but the buyer got a lower price. Why did they give the buyer a lower price? Because they're just about to screw the buyer. Agreed? Why would you give a buyer a lower price? Buy some more. Buy some more. We're averaging in. Get some more business done. I'm giving you two ticks better than you got the last time. And somebody goes, two ticks better? I'm going to buy two lots this time. I'm going to buy two lots this time. I'm going to get a total of three. I've got a better price. I'm going to increase the size of my trade. I'm finally, finally going to win this one. And then the very next candle, boom. They've just been screwed again. They've just been screwed. Market maker got them. So when you see these manipulation candles, you should be paying attention to them. These, these are all manipulation candles, these ones here. These are all manipulations. So this is a manipulation candle here. So when you see the delta going in the opposite, this was a manipulation candle here. This wasn't. This wasn't. This wasn't. This wasn't. This was a manipulation candle here. This was a manipulation candle here. This wasn't. And what you've got to try and do is figure out what you're going to do on these manipulation candles. What you've got to try and do is figure out what you're going to do on these trades because you know when you've got the if you've got a red delta and it's a manipulation it's usually bullish this this one here actually made money believe it or not because the volume was all at the top of this candle so the market maker came in against that buying delta at the top of the candle and then closed lower and obviously the market maker was able to make two or three ticks on that trade, no trouble. So the market maker, you might say, but it went up. Yeah, it did go up on this occasion. The market maker still made money because they don't trade for swings. They trade for twos, threes, four, five ticks at a time. Okay. And then we can see on this one, the market maker's long at this price here, this green price, and the price goes up. The market maker then gets short at this red price and the price goes down. It shouldn't be too difficult to spot the market maker's operation against these little rotations, is it? <clears throat> now, this is an 8 by 3 reversal candle. This is an 8 by 3 reversal candle. This is probably not detailed enough for scalping because we, as I said, when we're looking at, a, when we're looking at this type of a model, the whole chart probably takes up about two or three minutes. So in other words, 
this tiny bit of chart here takes up about 25 minutes. So this is too slow moving to get a real good handle on the order flow. We would have to use, if this was our chart, as a scalper, if this was our chart, this would probably be about 20 seconds of action, yeah? This would probably be about 20 seconds of action in here. Now remember one thing as well, the market maker doesn't always win. Sometimes the market maker gets absolutely stuffed by the big commercials, but when you see the market maker getting stuffed by the big commercials, you should absolutely pay attention to that because that break-even price for that market maker becomes a gold mine. That's the 50 pullback kind of concept again, isn't it? 50 pullback. But what happens on oil? You can see obviously that uh, the market maker goes very long here. They drop the liquidity down to this price here. So that's where the market maker's long price goes up. See it? You might be saying, yeah, but how did we know that? Because there's a fair amount of there's a fair amount of trade here, and they did pull it. But the price then goes bid. You can see this block order probably was the market maker sitting on the trade. Market maker probably sitting on the trade. Why? Because they got short at this price, didn't they? So if the market maker got short around about 36s, and they can close a trade off at 16s, for a market maker, that's, that's a 20 tick trade. That's brilliant, isn't it? Brilliant. And it only took them about two or three minutes to make 20 ticks. Two or three minutes to make 20 ticks. And then what do we see? What do we see? Well, that's not manipulation. That's not manipulation. That's not manipulation. And yet this has a little bit of manipulation. Why is that a little bit of manipulation here? It's not a manipulation bar, but why it, could it be? How could that be a possible manipulation bar? Because there's a pin on the deltas, and the deltas are incredibly, you know, it's almost a, it's just almost an open. And the candle does drop. Remember, you know, once you start understanding this, it's not just about the color of the candle. It's also, it's, you've got to take into account the size of the candle. Because the, the institutional selling, remember, is very important. When was the last institutional selling that the market maker paid attention to? Well, we can identify that by finding the big down candles with big deltas. So we know that there was institutional selling at this price. And it's difficult to establish exactly, but if we go back to where the deltas were here, you can see that there was some institutional selling at this price. So we know there's an institutional seller still sitting here at 5230s, and we know that that's still going to be a short trade opportunity. So when we then see, for example, a green delta and a down candle, we know that the market maker now recognizes that institutional selling, and we can be short the market. So there's an element that you've got to still make sure you watch for in the background going on that tells you about the commercial side of the trade. Okay? There's that element in the background allowing us to make a decision about what's kicking off in the background. And once we understand that, we can kind of make sense of this. So there's an institutional buyer. How do we know that's an institutional buyer? Because the market maker pulled their liquidity based on that trade. There's a lot of buying deltas coming in, and the market maker paid attention to it. And the market makers paid attention to it. So we can obviously understand that if that's the case, the market maker withdrew liquidity here, and somebody bought the market here. Somebody bought the market here, and then they were really worried about this. So there's obviously been some institutional buying, perhaps off of this level. And therefore, we've got to be watching that level going forward as a possible trade opportunity. So when we see the price coming back into this area, we want to see whether the market maker takes the opposite view, which they don't. They're actually going in the opposite direction. Look, they've got a big withdrawal of liquidity here with very, very small deltas. So this, the market makers actually are bearish in here, not bullish. So therefore, as an institutional trader, as a trader, you're looking at this, looking for a, looking for a, a candle that obviously shows something really interesting, a very big selling delta perhaps, and absolutely no movement, because that would suggest that commercial buyer is still in place, wouldn't it? If we got a big selling delta and a very small candle with perhaps a close just above the volume, that would tell us that the commercial buyer is still in place. Well, we don't get that. We get the exact opposite. 
we got very large down candles with a very, very little selling. That means that market makers are obviously going to be looking to try and keep testing lower and lower and lower prices until they figure this thing out. And what happens? The price just breaks. Boom. We get an unfinished auction at the bottom. So the market maker was absolutely correct, but we get an unfinished auction at the bottom here. And then we got a manipulation candle. Look. We got a manipulation candle. Market maker. If it's red, the market maker's long. And obviously at that stage, the market maker's now thinking this price is going to go up, don't they? Why? How do we know that? Because we've now got manipulation candles taking place here. They're giving, they're giving sellers lower prices here, aren't they? You see that? They're giving a seller, because we know that there's negative deltas, a lower price. And they're giving a, they're giving a seller again here a lower price. They're starting to show up as a manipulation because the market maker's buying. The market maker's buying from those, sorry, a seller with a lower price. They're giving the seller a higher price. So the market maker's almost as if, it's almost as if the market maker's giving, them, giving themselves a really poor deal. Market maker's never giving, them, giving themselves a really poor deal. Market maker's never give themselves really poor deals. So when I see this happening here and here, the market makers giving sellers these high prices. How do we know it's a high price? Because it's a green candle. So they must be giving sellers higher prices. That's not a free lunch, guys. That's a costly trade for the seller. Almost guaranteed. The vast majority of times, not 100%, but the vast majority of times, this is almost a guarantee long trade. Boom. You see it? Two manipulation candles. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're $160 better off. You see it? Two manipulation candles, and all of a sudden, you're 160 bucks better off inside of a period of about three minutes. So it's not that difficult to be a scalper, guys. You've, just, you've got to read the narrative. You've got to obviously get into these kind of concepts, haven't you? And obviously, you can keep watching for all of these. The market maker was obviously what during this process? Does anybody see any manipulation candles here? So the market maker was obviously bullish on this candle, bullish on this candle. And obviously, that's not a manipulation candle. But this is different. What's the market maker on this candle? Bullish or bearish? The market maker is getting short. The market maker is getting short at lower prices. If the market maker is getting short at lower prices, what are they? Bearish. We get another bearish manipulation here. We get another bearish manipulation here. Is it starting to give you a strong storyline about a possible bear trade around this area? Market maker must be really bearish off 72s, 73, 74, 75. Does everybody agree with that narrative? If you don't agree, tell me so that we know that you don't understand this. But does everybody understand that this is a very, a very bearish setup here? Market makers are giving buyers a better deal because there's buyers coming in. Market maker is the opposite of the delta. If the market maker is the opposite of the delta, but the prices are going lower, the market maker is giving a buyer a better opportunity. This is what we told you yesterday, isn't it? So if that's the case, the market maker must be really bearish off of around about 72 to 76. Really bearish. What happens next? Boom. You just made $450. In about three minutes. Now, if you add that $450 onto the previous $2,000 or $3,000 or $5,000 that you'd made on a two lot earlier, and you added another second contract to that, you're probably sitting on about $5,000 as a two lot scalper using this concept. And all you've traded is oil looking at market makers' rotations and market makers' auctions as a scalper. 
this is the this is the big exception because you don't expect big breaks, but when you get them, you should be on the right side of the market maker during it. And you were on the right side of the market maker with this candle here, this candle here, and this candle here. And there she goes. And there she goes. Now I can't make this up, guys, because this is this is this afternoon's oil market. Do you know what I mean? We can't make it up. It is what it is. I mean, it's 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 there for everybody to see and interpret. And obviously, in the background, you would have some sort of developing narrative about whether you were commercially bullish or bearish a particular market, and how you would use that bullishness or bearishness to try and figure out whether you're going to go long or short into any one of these trades. I mean, obviously, if you're bullish in this phase, you're not going to take advantage of this because you know you're going to get a lower price for a commercial buy. Agreed? When do commercials buy? When do commercials buy? Candles like this. You agree with that? If I'm if I'm a if I'm a commercial buyer for a swing, I'm going to see the market maker setting this up for a drop, and I'm going to be expecting because guess what's going to happen to all those buying deltas? Guess what's going to happen to all those buying deltas that are creeping into the market here? They're all going to be doing what very shortly? Selling. So when I see the market maker setting this up as a commercial buyer, I'm going to start setting up a buy trade, knowing that the break is going to be 5160. I'm going to start setting a, up a commercial buy trade around about. We're going to take it through to 5150. We know that the trade is usually going to be about 45. I'm probably going to start buying that part of that trade because there's going to be selling coming in here and it's going to follow through. And so long as the volume isn't down here at 32, because if the volume was there, the market maker didn't absorb the liquidity on the stop run. I'd be concerned if the market maker didn't absorb the liquidity in the stop run. We might try and absorb some of it. Depends how bullish we were or if we wanted to get into that trade really rapidly. But with the liquidity at 50, I'd have been a little bit concerned about it. But the market maker did absorb the liquidity in the stop run. See it? There's the liquidity right there being absorbed by the market maker. That's them just basically closing off their, 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 their book here. So if the market maker closed their book off here, the market maker must not be that bearish. If the market maker was bearish, they wouldn't provide the guys on the stops with any liquidity. And the guys on the stops would slip through this level like crazy. Well, they didn't slip through the level like crazy. They actually got out with a stop of ones and twos and threes and fours. So they didn't slip those sellers. Therefore, the market maker can't be that bearish. Otherwise, they would have slipped the sellers, wouldn't they? And that volume would have printed a lot lower if they were bearish. The volume didn't print a lot lower, so they're not bearish. The market maker's not bearish. You might say, that's a hell of a bearish bar. The market maker is not bearish. If they were bearish, that volume node would be at the bottom of the candle. So when we read this, we know that this becomes a buying opportunity, perhaps, if you wanted. We don't have value in this chart, but this, this becomes a buying opportunity for commercial buys. I'm interested now. I'm excited now about buying this market off the off the market makers. And what happens? A bit of pressure, but look at the candles coming in. You can see why we got a bit of pressure, because the market maker took the other side of the trade. The market maker was still going short on this trade. So when we see that, we know that there's still a bit of sell side pressure coming in, don't we? We know that because we can see it. We can see the candles developing. I mean, this is a real-time candle that develops. That's a negative candle, and this is a negative candle. But again, you can see that the volume is quite high on the candle. So guess what? This is an, this becomes an institutional accumulation here. It's now started, isn't it? It's now started. What we're really wanting to see, what we're really wanting to see, is an up candle with red deltas. Because that means that the market maker is now is now giving sellers a ridiculously good price 
which means that they now believe, and we're just reading the market maker, we're not reading the commercials, we're reading the market maker. That means that they must be getting bullish on a manipulation. Does anybody see a red delta with a green candle? Anybody see a red delta on a green candle? Yeah. There's the red delta on the green candle finally appeared just here, isn't it? So obviously what's now being what's now happening here is that the market makers now starting to realize, wait a second. I know it's only a slither, guys. We get that. We understand that it's just a slither, but we can only start with something, the color of the candle and the color of the the color of the delta. So in that situation there, you've got to be looking at it saying, okay, we gonna get this. On this one candle, the market maker has offered sellers a really good a really good high price. Why would they do that? Well, they now must believe that this is now a bottom edge. And we can obviously watch for further evidence of that, perhaps a perhaps a, the perhaps a big delta down candle and, a, and and the volume's all at the top. Do you know what I mean? If the volume's all at the top and the big delta down candle, it means they're trying to encourage sellers in, but nobody's biting at lower prices. So you're always watching that. But look at what happened next after that accumulation buy trade. Boom, money's good. Do you not see it, guys? We just told you we, the, 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 this tail, this 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 little bit of trade here, this this absorption of those stops following that manipulation tells me that this is now a commercial long trade at these prices, just based on the order flow. And therefore, when we understand that, we're not guaranteeing that this trade's going to be a winner or this trade's going to be a winner. But what we are guaranteeing is that this swing is going to be a winner. Do you see the difference? It's now a swing trade. It's not necessarily a scalp trade because the best scalp trades are momentum-based scalp trades. The best trades are momentum-based scalp trades. Because obviously we're starting to get that message from the commercials to the market makers, get off. Be gone with you because this market's going to go higher or lower. And obviously what happens to that commercial long trade is we get this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful swing. Perfect swing. Off the bottom edge prices of about 20 up to 80. So we end up making $600 on the commercial swing. Does it all not make perfect sense, guys, when you stop a second and think about it? When you actually get into the order flow properly, does it not start to make sense? Now, obviously, one of the things you can then add to this is, is when are the commercials going to be excited about this trade? When are they going to show up in terms of this trade? What are they looking for in terms of a trade opportunity to start taking advantage of this? Well, they're looking for the euro to maybe start going bid, aren't they? You know, why would the commercial take an interest in this area rather than up here? Why did the commercials buy this th this 30 level instead of buying the 50 level break? Why did they come in here instead of 70s? Well, let's take a look at the uh, let's take a look at that point point on the chart in terms of in terms of value. Now take a look at the time. It's 1450. It's 1450. Does everybody agree? It's 1450 on the charts. Yeah, so you're not, we're not, we're not diagonally changing anything. We're not trying to make you look at something that isn't in existence. But if you look at 1450 on the chart, and I now bring across the value chart, does anybody see an opportunity for the commercials? Not the market makers, the commercials. Does anybody see an opportunity for the commercials? Do you see the euro starting to go up? Do you see the 10 spread diverging in the background? Do you see it? Do you see the 10 spread starting to go up and diverging in the background? Do you see the euro starting to go up? So anybody that's anybody that's trading the euro has an opportunity on this downtick to hedge the euro, do they not? Yes or no? How do they have an opportunity to hedge the euro, I can hear you say. Well, let me draw a line. If I draw a line on this downtick on the euro here, and I draw it to the 10 spreads, does anybody see an opportunity to hedge the long euro on an uptick on the 10 spreads, yes or no? 
Do you see it? So how do we know this euro is going to get bought? Because you've got the perfect hedge for the euro now. You've got a big discounted price. It's just gamed the liquidity in the background. See it? So for a commercial, do you see the buy on the euro here? Because they're going to sell the red line and they're going to buy the, the, uh, the orange line. So even though the euro is dropping, you know that the euro is going to go up, don't you? You know the euro is going to go up because you know the red line is going to come down and the euro is going to go up and you're going to get a hedge trade. You know that. But here's the point. Here's the key point. You know that information. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven minutes. You know that information seven minutes before the commercial long trade on oil. Following this order flow sequence. Seven minutes. You already know that this is a buy trade seven minutes before it happens. Because obviously what you're now waiting for is you're now waiting for the commercial buyers to get a discount. There's the commercial buyer discount running through 60. Remember we talked about the stop run? There's a commercial buyer discount right there. That's it. That's how the commercials deal. They get a discount on the price. They know that the value is now going bullish. There's the commercial buy, the whole candle, not the bottom of the candle. Not the top of the candle, the middle of the candle. The whole candle is commercial buying. And obviously, what shows up in terms of volume? Do you get a volume surge? What do you think? Do you get a volume surge to show you that there's some commercial buying on this candle? Yes or no? What do you think? Does anybody see a huge volume surge? For commercial buying on that candle. I mean, I can't. I, honestly, I can't make it up, can I? I can't. I can't show you something that doesn't actually exist. It's not a whiteboard drawing. It's the physical charts from today, using the simple concepts that we teach every single day in this room about high volume down candles or commercial buyers. And it's not just the fact that it's a commercial buy. It's the fact that it's a commercial buy below a wholesale price level. With the market makers telling us it was going to happen seven minutes before it happened. Now, you might be saying seven minutes is not a lot of time. I'm sorry, guys, but that's the, the kind of, in a lot of cases, that's, what, that's how much time you're going to have to make your mind up about what you're going to do. Because you can't do it when the euro's dropping. But when you then see that the red line spikes up, the 10 spread spikes up, now you're saying, I'm going to buy that euro. And the euro currency guys are all buying euros at bottom edges, but you know that. And as an energy trader, you're saying, I'm going to buy the break of that 50. Congratulations. Welcome to the world of commercial trading. So you're going to buy 5130s. You're now going to be long the oil, and you're now going to be looking for what happens next. You know there's a commercial trade in here, not a market maker's trade, a commercial trade. So you're not really concerned about the market maker. You've sold the sell. You've sold the squeeze. You've sold the squeeze. You've got the squeeze. Now you've got a commercial swing because this squeeze was all based around the market makers short trade. This bottom edge is all based around the commercials long swing trade. What happens next? Well, what happens next, of course? Is it the price in terms of the commercial swing trade? What happens next, of course, is that the price, in terms of the commercial swing, moves all the way to the top edge. See the commercial swing against the market makers? And obviously, in all of these areas here, there's market maker trades. But we know where the, we know where the 50 line is. Remember, we talked about the 50 line having the spring trade for the market maker. Well, there's this. There's the 50 line spring trade right there, isn't it? There's the 50 line. There's your buy side springs. There's your buy side springs trying to game liquidity into these areas. And what you're now expecting is you're now expecting a measure from that block trade here at 5120s up to the 50 line around about 5180s, which means it's about a 60 tick trade. And obviously, based on 60 ticks at 5180, where's your target price? If the bottom price is 5120, 
and the 50 line is around about 5180, where's your target price? If you've got your bracket now at this level here, 5120, 5180, 60 ticks, 5240 is now the target price for this trade, isn't it? Does everybody agree with that? 5240 is now the target price. Well, what happens to price? You see it? I mean, you know, as I said, guys, I mean, we can't we can't make any of this stuff up because you've all done the classroom. You've all understood the processes. You've all understood the the spring trade, the accum the commercial the commercial long trade at a discount price. The commercial long trade at a discount price. The spring trade in the top right hand hold. There's the 50 line. You can see the spring trade takes place above the 50 line. The price then breaks to give us the change of behavior and the, the new 50 line price for the bracket. And then we make some projection highs based on that bracket bottom edge, 50 line, top edge. Okay. Now, obviously, you can see that uh, you can see where the you can see where the market makers might start taking an interest because you can start watching these big buying deltas knowing that the market maker is having to take the short side. So you want to make sure that the market maker is pulling liquidity away really hard on, on those buying deltas. If the market maker isn't pulling liquidity hard on those buying deltas, there's a high probability that that's going to be the top edge. So when we go along to the right hand edge of the chart, you can see that there's a big buying delta here that they definitely pull hard. But look at where the volume is. See how it's at the top of the candle. Market maker must be really bullish on that one. Agreed. What about the next big delta here? Do you see where the volume is on the next big delta, guys? Do you see it? There's the big delta right here. But do you see where the volume is on that big delta? It's at the bottom of the candle. Do you see it right there? There's a volume at the bottom of the candle. What is that starting to tell you about the market makers? Remember, the market makers getting heavy short, heavy short at the volume node. If they're getting heavy short at the volume node, what are they doing? They're bearish. They're starting to get bearish, aren't they? So if they're starting to get bearish, would it be reasonable? Would it be reasonable? to just move above the top edge there and start thinking about the possibility of getting short business into that top edge. Would that be a reasonable proposition for any one of you? We can see that there was a market maker manipulation on this candle, so we knew we were going to get the squeeze, agreed? The market maker's going bullish on an up candle, so we know we're going higher. Does everybody see the squeeze? We know we're going higher. Does everybody see the squeeze? The market maker's gone bullish. Negative deltas means the market maker is now bullish, and they give they give the seller a higher price. So if they give the seller a higher price, they must be they must be bullish on this one candle. Boom, price goes up. But because of this candle that preceded it. I'm starting to think this is probably a top edge. Now, surprisingly enough, it's very close to that target price of 52.40. So the market maker is obviously trying to get a little bit of jiggery pokery going on in here to try and make the market flip over. And you can see, obviously, the big volume comes in here. You can see the big block trade. As soon as the price took out the high there, there was a big block sell. Who do you think that was? Market maker, eh? You got a big block sell, so that must have been the market maker sitting just above the stops. See how the big block was right above the stops? So the market maker must have been sitting on the book, waiting to take the buy st the buyer the seller stops, the buy stops, and then they just exhausted through to 52, uh, 52 40. That's why we didn't get 5240, because the price exhausted through to that level. And then your job then would be saying, I get this, I now understand this story completely. So I now think that the market maker is bearish at 52.40s 
I'm going to get a little short trade around about 28 once we get back inside that value. And all, all of a sudden, you've just gone 28 down to a price of 52s, $280 of very simple, easy order flow profits to the downside. It's off a key level. It's got some key narratives building in the background regarding where the market maker thinks the volume is, what the market maker is doing with that volume. Because if they were really bullish on this candle, guys, that volume would be at the top of the candle. Think about it. Because the market maker would not absorb the stops. They did absorb the stops. They did absorb the stops off this top edge, didn't they? Not that top edge, sorry, this top edge. They did absorb the stops off that top edge. If they're absorbing the stops, they can't be that bullish. Because if they were really bullish, they would just let the price run through to the top of the candle. They don't let it run through to the top of the candle. The price expires at the top of the candle here, guys. It just exhausts out. They're bearish. And obviously, this becomes a top edge opportunity to rattle some sell side business into. And because the market maker's got a lot of shorts here and a lot of shorts here, we know where the short price is. There's the big volume there. So the market maker is heavy short at this price. Then obviously they're going to try and pull the liquidity down to try and get that price, aren't they? They're going to just pull the liquidity away to try and get that price because the market maker now is in massive profits. The market maker is now in massive profits because they pulled the liquidity away because they started to pick up quite a lot of bearish side business. And they're now taking some profits out because you can see that they've pulled it right through that level. Enormous profit for the market maker. And if you follow the market maker's model and you overlay the concept of the commercials that are dealing so that you understand the commercial swing trades that are also available, all of a sudden trading can become in not incredibly easy because it's not easy. But you can start to see some of these trades on the screens. You can actually start to understand some of these concepts. Now, take a look at that. Take a look at that move. Uh, take a look at that move on oil up to that key level where the market maker went bearish. What do you see on the euro? What do you see on the euro? It's improving a little bit, isn't it? But it's not improving that much. You can see if we were doing a 10, if we were doing the spread trade, in other words, we did the plus two scenario. Does everybody see that the red line is in profit at this stage and the euro is also in profit? So the spread traders have made a very nice trade. Spread traders made a very nice trade. They sell the red line and they buy the euro. It's a spread trade. It's a hedge trade. So obviously, we're not expecting the euro to explode to the upside because obviously a lot of people have sold the red line. You can see every time the red line comes up spiking to the upside, they sell it. And what happens to the red line is it becomes a negative correlation to the euro, doesn't it? That's how you know there's a hedge trade taking place in the currency markets because the red line will be a negative correlation, not a positive correlation. Do you understand that? Because if the if the market's in a positive correlation, it can't be a hedged market because it's just a directional bet. But if it's going in opposite directions, as it did here, we know it's a hedge trade. We know this is a hedge trade. And generally, as a rule, the euro will move in the direction, obviously, of where the red line is. And the red line will move in the direction of where the euro is because it is a hedge. As the red line goes up to the top edges up here and the euro drops back down, another hedge. As the red line goes away up to the top edges here and the euro drops down, another hedge. So if you're a currency trader, you'll be able to see if the hedge is doing exactly what you thought it was doing and pick up these long trades all the way, all the way through this process. The euro will go up and the 10 spread will go down. The euro will go up, the 10 spread will go down. So we know that this is all hedging that's going on in here. Okay, so we know it's all hedging that's going on in here. You can see exactly the same happened again here. You can see that the, the hedge was still traded here. But one of the things we can see in here is that it is still getting hedged because the red line starts going up and the euro drops. 
So they can't be that confident about the euro exploding to the upside, because if they were confident about the euro exploding to the upside, what would they do with the red line? They would stop selling it at top edges. They wouldn't hedge, and they would just allow the euro to then move in the direction of the red line, wouldn't they? So what would happen on this chart here, what would happen on this chart here is that the, you know, if we've got a situation whereby the red and the orange line is doing this, okay, so let me just take you back a little bit here. Okay, so there's the red line doing that. Oopsies. And there's the euro doing this. That means that the it's getting hedged. That's a hedge that's in place. So when the when the orange line does this and the red line does this, that confirms that the hedge is definitely in place. So when the red line does this and the orange line does this, that's the hedge still in place. Now, what happens next? Obviously, is if the red line starts coming down and the orange line does the same, here, we're still in a hedge position. But what happens if the if what happens if the traders are starting to get really bullish? The euro. What's going to happen if they're really bullish the euro? Well, what's going to happen is that the euro is going to do this. They're going to unwind this red line entirely. The red line is going to do that. And you're thinking a hedge, you're still thinking hedge. You're still thinking hedge. But obviously, because they don't sell the red line, the red line maybe still does that. And the euro stops dropping down, perhaps, and we get a top right hand hold. And what's going to happen next is that's going to happen next, isn't it? They've, they've stopped hedging it, and now they expect a directional bet on the euro. Okay? The red line in this case is just the 10 spreads, so the German US 10 spreads, in other words, the biggest hedge market that is used for the euro dollar trade. So if we saw that happening, then obviously we'd be really bullish the euro, and we'd also be really bullish the oil, really bullish the oil. If it doesn't happen, we can't be really bullish the oil. And obviously it's not happening here, look, because the euro is going up, but every single time the, pre every time the 10 goes up, the euro actually drops back off. So you're now thinking to yourself, at that price, I think this is possibly a it could be a top edge short because there's a value divergence in the euro. Look, take us 10 spreads off a second. And is there anybody that doesn't see that value divergence against that wholesale change of behavior level right there? Now, we've obviously also got a target price of about 40 on the, on the basis of these, these levels moving forward in terms of change of behaviors and blah, 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 blah. We've got a target price up here. We can also see that we have a very, very, very significant value divergence. So there's a very good chance that there's a commercial reason to get short at this price as well. Well, see if you can start adding a commercial reason to get short and a market maker activity suggesting that the market makers are short. Remember, the market makers are, are very similar to the commercials. Market makers will sell in uptics. Prop desks are momentum traders. In other words, Speculators are momentum traders. Speculators will buy at higher prices. That's why you see uh, in the uh, that's why you see in the uh, in the COT, for example. That's why you see that the commercials have a negative correlation to price. But when the commercials get really heavily involved, the price generally stops and the price spins on a dime and the price then reverses. So these are the types of things that we're now paying attention to. And obviously what happened next is that we simply got that commercial short in line with the fact that the market maker was now starting to get short, in line with the break above this key wholesale, which is just this change of behavior. Remember, what is this price? What is this price? Well, this price is very, very obvious. It's just a pullback. Remember, we says that it's usually going to be the 50 line in the big picture. Remember we talked about the 50 line being an incredibly important price in the big picture. Is there any significance, therefore, to the fact that that was a swing high, that was a swing low, and this was the 50 line at approximately the same price? Any significance? Yeah, you bet your, you bet your bottom dollar there's a significance to this. It's got nothing to do with Fibonacci. It's to do with simple arithmetic. That's what it's to do with. So we now know that this is also a 50 pullback. It's also the 
50 it's also the measured projection it's also the change of behavior and we see the market maker absorbing stops what else do you need to see to get some short oil guys what else do you need to see to get some short oil maybe some short term selling coming in in the euro well, if I take you along to the decision, do you see any short-term selling coming in in the euro? It's right there, isn't it? It's right there. And obviously what happens next is the price then trades away from that level. So when you start looking at it from that perspective of adding the commercial, adding the commercial trade, To the, to the market makers trade, a lot of people say, well, do you prefer the commercials or do you prefer the market makers? Then obviously I'm gonna always prefer the commercials, but when I get down into the order flow chart, I change into the market makers to find the right trades in line with the commercials. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, put, you know, fair enough, we're gonna, we're gonna scalp and do business around all of these kind of areas. The commercial trade is here, and the commercial trade is here, and the in between is all market making information that we can use to see exactly that we're going to get to our target price or fail to achieve our target price, isn't it? And that's what we've got to try and do when we're using this uh, type of trade. You can see if the if there's a lot of selling deltas and the value is at the low as it is at the moment, the market maker must still be relatively bearish, otherwise. Otherwise, they would have absorbed that stop run, wouldn't they? They must be still relatively bearish. Otherwise, they would have absorbed that stop run as soon as the price came out, out, out here. But they did take it lower, so the market maker must still be relatively bearish. Was there any was there any manipulations that we could use? Not really, because the two green candles had some green deltas, so we can't highlight any particular manipulations. But we did see that the market maker is bearish. But look at what happened in the next candle; it dropped. You see it? So if you know that the market maker's still bearish here, you could have obviously have sold maybe this little pullback and got some short business, maybe for about another hundred dollars. It's a good scalp trade because you knew the market maker was bearish because of where the volume was on that selling delta. You knew the market maker was bearish on this candle because you see where all the volume is, it's right on the bottom of that candle. So we know the market maker must still be bearish on that. Because otherwise they might have absorbed it an awful lot earlier, but they didn't. They took they took it all the way down to this price, so they must have been concerned about the price getting to that. You can see that that bearish market maker, even on a low price, I was still able to tell you that they're bearish and that they expect the price to go lower. And look at what's happened. It's now went from 77s down to a price of 64s. It's now went 130 dollars to the sell side. $130, guys, and that's only taken the last 60 seconds to find that trade, get into that trade, make some money. Think about it. Think about the power of that information. And yet it's about reading the tape. It's all about just reading the tape, finding the right trades, reading the order flow. And this is where market profile actually can be really useful. And it's the one use that they don't really use market profile in when you look at Stadelmeyer or Dalton. You don't really look at Stadelmeyer or Dalton and, and see that trade. You can see the market maker must have went bullish here because obviously what's happened is the market makers went bullish, but they've given the seller a higher price. So the market makers temporarily went bullish on this trade now, haven't they? So you know that as the price then comes up into this area, the market maker is going to try and make some money as the market breaks off that volume. Now they've gone bearish again. But they still made probably about five or six ticks on that trade. Think about it. You may say that never worked. It did work. It worked perfectly. It was just that there was still some selling coming in that the market maker says, oh, well, still some selling. I'm just going to rotate it back. That's okay. The market maker's not in any danger here. And they pulled away the liquidity again and let the price drop through. Now, the selling is still heavy volume to the downside. Still heavy volume to the downside, but there's a big big block print that's just appeared there. So you're going to be watching now to see the same type of trade. Now the market maker's pulling liquidity above the market. Why are they doing that? They're obviously a little bit concerned about possibly a buyer starting to step into the market. Market maker, very, 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 very small number of buy side deltas. 
and yet the market makers giving you obviously the market makers doing you know everything they can not to give buyers a high price so we're going to be watching this now to see if selling comes in because if the if the delta goes sell side and the candle stays green they're giving the seller a great price and the buyer a terrible price and that's quite interesting because they you know, they did try to take it higher they lost that the delta stayed a little bit positive so we can't really use that as a trade so we just have to assume at the moment they still have this overall position that they're still relatively bearish but guys this is just practice there's nothing special about anything i've talked about today there's nothing that we've talked about today that you haven't already done on your charts and when you think about what we started they were talking about we started talking about this process of the candle and the deltas the candle and the profiles the candle and the idea of where the open and the close is against that delta print and that's what the pit traders do this concept that the pit traders use they're looking at buying you know, we're talking about the locals the guys that provide liquidity and the locals that are providing liquidity they're watching for the commercials across the across the pit and if they see commercials across the pit they stop buying from them because they know that commercial is going to railroad them right through that price they're just going to run clean through that price and the trade's going to be a horrible trade for the local okay so when we start to understand that one of the things we've got to start understanding is that when trade comes in when the commercial comes in and the local wants it the local either knows that the commercial is exiting a trade so it's not them getting net longs or getting shorts it's not the commercials exit it's not the commercials getting into a new trade it's the commercials distributing so when we see that commercial distribution the locals will take the side that side of the trade because they obviously are quite happy because it's not them getting sell side against them they're getting sellers distributing and therefore they're not taking on a new position they're taking on a, somebody that's getting out of a position and they could probably railroad the, the commercial at that stage that's why when the market maker knows we're going to take a profit they a lot of the times r rattle the liquidity so that we can't get off the trade which is why we've got to keep buying on down ticks to get off a short trade and selling on up ticks to get off a long trade because we need to try and step in front of the market maker because the market maker is just going to flip the trade over against us and we're going to end up not being able to get out of the business okay you can see that there's still a big withdrawal of liquidity on this phase look they're still net selling deltas but look at what's happened to the price do you see it so this is a bottom edge make no mistake about it it's also a key wholesale price 5150s this is a bottom edge the market maker is getting net positive net positive at higher prices and we'd already identified it on this candle here when we started to see what was happening so the market maker is bullish here because they're starting to give the, the they're starting to give the sellers higher prices net higher prices so we know that this is going to be bullish we know it's got a chance of making it to the upside but guess what you should be doing just now finding the last commercial seller where was the last big commercial seller well it was good volume here good deltas here and it was a good strong down candle with volume built to this price so the market maker must have detected a commercial seller at this price here so if you're in a long trade here you would be using that eight that uh, 80 price as a first possible target price you see how we can do that if you've got a big selling delta and the volumes all at the bottom of the candle then you must think that there's got a, the market maker must have detected commercial selling for that candle and that delta to happen so therefore this level is something that's very interesting to you and you can see exactly what's happened the price has just traded 80 and stopped moving higher it's just traded 80 down to 70. do you see it do you see it so there is a commercial seller here the market maker knows there's a commercial seller here pulls the liquidity up to that and obviously there's absolutely no buying coming in they've pulled the liquidity there's nothing here and the price rotates off by you know 15 ticks we drew that level in before it happened guys you might not believe it but we did we drew that level in before the price rejected off that price there at 80. 
you look back in the recording, you'll see exactly that that's what happened. You see how it's possible, guys, to work your way through this. All we've done is we've highlighted commercial, you know, we've highlighted manipulation candles, for example. And we've looked at those manipulation candles as pieces of information, not as trades, but as pieces of information. And through that piece of information, we've then been able to analyze the idea of what's happening in terms of value, volume, deltas, and price action. Well, surely if you can add value, volume, deltas, and price action all together into the mix, you've probably got the perfect trade. Well, the answer is, yes, you do. You have the perfect trade. Because you're using all the elements that we teach in this room, price action, volumes, deltas, value analysis. Everything is in the trade right there, isn't it? Everything. And if you can see it, well, you can start dealing it, can't you? You can see the market maker is still getting bullish. See how the deltas are still net short right through this period, but the price is still going up. Market makers are really bullish off this down tick. But there is still a commercial seller at 80 that they've still got to be paying attention to. And that's why you can see the big volume appears at slightly lower, around about that 72 price. And obviously, if we can start to see the delta starting to get absorbed, we know the commercial seller is still there. If we the delta starting to get absorbed, we know the commercial seller is still there. If we see the delta is not getting absorbed and it pushes through that level, we know the commercial seller has gone. And that becomes a possible buy level on the way back down again, doesn't it? Now, what would be the ideal strategy here? The ideal strategy, of course, would be to see a selling candle with a green candle. A selling candle, as in selling deltas with a green candle. That would be the perfect trade. Because that would tell us that there's sellers coming in, but the market maker's quite happy to take the selling on at a higher price. The market maker's going bullish at a higher price. That would be the perfect candle right here, wouldn't it? And obviously, in that type of situation, you'd be able to look at it and say, "I know exactly what's going to happen next," and take it forward. But if you were on a lower, if you were on a lower auction, you would start to see this stuff in a little bit more detail. The commercial seller that came in before that was the last big delta with the volume at the bottom of the candle. So the last big delta with the volume at the bottom of the candle was this candle here. So we know that the commercial selling must have been detected at that price. Surprisingly enough, the break of 52. You see it? So that's where the last big commercial seller must have been detected by the market maker because that candle can't form otherwise. It's impossible. It's impossible for that candle to form unless there was a commercial seller detected at 5204s. The market maker pulls her liquidity really quickly, doesn't absorb the stop run, and then takes the business at a very, very low price, allowing them still the opportunity to make some business there on that rotation. You see that? So you can see that this bullish bottom edge at 50 has been absolutely spot on perfect, hasn't it? When you think about it, spot on perfect. You can see the price is still going up on buying deltas, so we can't really read an awful lot into that. We're just going to have to wait to see if a new buying situation or selling situation sets up that we can then say, OK, I kind of get that now. I kind of see what's going on here. I mean, there could be a big absorption by the commercials here, but you've got to remember, the other thing you can be looking at, obviously, during this is your value charts. And you can start saying, well, would there be a reason for the commercials to sell here? This was a, technically a failed auction, and this was the big commercial level at the bottom of this chart. Remember that? Do you remember that commercial buyer down here? Sorry, does he sell Remember that big commercial buyer in here? Well, that's the same price we've just touched. You agree? It's the same price that we told you about at the start of this classroom that the commercial buyer had appeared from. So if we know the commercial buyer had appeared, this was a whole trade with the euro and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you'd drawn that level on your charts, if you'd drawn that level on your charts, you would have had a very large 
And we did draw the level in the chart, by the way, guys. There it is there. Remember this? You'd have already have known the existence of that level, and you would have been prepared and ready for the buy trade, wouldn't you? So when you saw that selling delta coming in and the prices were working their way higher, you're saying the sellers are getting a damn good deal. I know why they're getting a good deal, because this price is now going to break higher. I'm going to start buying down ticks. I'm going to start buying two or three tick back pressure down ticks. And obviously what's happened next is we've just absolutely moved this price beautifully. In this transition off the bottom edge at 50, back up to high print price of 88s. That's sensational, guys. Absolutely sensational. And obviously we've got a possibility that we're going to start looking to game that 52 by the end of by the end of today, aren't we? That's what we're going to be thinking that we're going to be looking to try and do, is game the 50 by the end of today. Is it right to think that every commercial buy you see at the start of this move, you should see similar distribution in terms of volume? Um, yep, absolutely. Absolutely. If they're uh, heavy buyers, they've got to be heavy sellers. If they're heavy sellers, they've got to be heavy buyers. They've got to get rid of their trade. It will show up. It will show up. And obviously, you can, uh, you can, you can look at that in terms of making a, a volume model where you've got equal size uh, volume distributions. But remember, it's not as easy to see it as a single price point. What I mean by that is that um, if, if I believe that this was a, a, a buy trade and all of this volume was buying, then obviously this, the, the distribution takes place on all of these upticks once we get above this 50 line. So part of that part of that volume, this volume here is definitely part of that distribution. Well, that's about a, a third of that total volume, yeah. So that volume, that volume in this candle, and I'll just mark it uh, for you. The volume in this candle is about a third of the volume of the of the buy trade. So there's about a third of the distribution takes place here. But when you add all the volume of all of those up candles, you'll find that all of the volume of all of the by the time we get to this point, you're probably fully distributed, haven't you? In terms of just pure volume, you're probably fully distributed by the time we get to this point. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because now what we can see is that any move higher is now an opportunity to get net shorts. So we can see that that move higher here is now an opportunity to get net short business done. And obviously the volume that comes in off the top edge, the buy and the sell volume that comes in off the top edge, is then open to distribution. And what we start looking for is that distribution process on the way back down through this 50 line again. And when we break through this 50 line, we start watching the volume building. And you can see that that big down candle plus that big down candle is probably the same as the volume that came in here, isn't it? So the distribution probably finished on the last big down candle, which is, which is this candle here. The last big down candle was this candle here. So that's probably where the distribution finished in terms of pure volume. And then any price below that is an opportunity to maybe buy some oil. Yeah, buy some oil and take the market bid off of that price with a target price, obviously, what we just discussed with 50, 52s. Um, the pink and yellow lines on Sierra charts here is, is, the, um, is the time segmented volume, Dan. Uh, sorry, who asked the question? Well, Harry, um, it's time segmented volume on Sierra charts. It's not the, it's not the histogram, it's just the... Um, it's just the uh, moving average, basically the moving average of the volume lines. So when you're looking at time segmented volume, you're looking at lower lower highs and higher lows to know where the trade is starting to take place. So when we zoom in on this, you can see this bottom edge distribution. Uh, sorry, this bottom edge accumulation. Can you see it? Can you see the bottom edge accumulation, guys? We should have a divergence on this trade. You see the top edge accumulation. You should have a divergence on that trade. You see it? So when I take you along to this chart here, do you see where the big accumulations take place on either side of the trade using time segmented volume? There's the highest peak here. So obviously, if that's the highest peak, when we've got these divergences happening, this must be these big block orders up here, all these big yellow block orders must be short accumulation. 
So when we start seeing divergence during this period, all of these blue block orders must be accumulation. Yeah. And that's just using the peaks in volume to then establish the idea of where that trade is probably located in terms of key swings. And that's why the time segmented volume can be quite useful. That's why we can be, it can be quite useful to see time segmented volume. When you're zoomed in like this, you don't really get an appreciation of the trade, but you can still see the divergence on the pink line. You can still see that concept of the divergence on the pink line showing that the volume is now peaked and we're now into the possible buy phase of the market off the bottom, yeah? Um, always block orders at the top. Yeah, in most cases, yeah, absolutely. Because block orders, you know, if they can get filled, will get filled, you know? I mean, a lot of the times you don't get filled, so it doesn't show as a block order. But if you can get filled on a block order, then why the hell not? Absolutely, take it. So when we do see it happening, we can obviously start looking at that block order and say, okay, well, that was interesting. Somebody decided to do active business there. Why did they do it? That's why we look at the price action that happens afterwards. Any questions about this, guys? I mean, are we quite happy? I know it's a big, long classroom regarding purely the market maker's auction, because that's all we've talked about is a market maker's auction inside the world of the commercial trader. But, but when we add the market maker's auction, when we add the market maker's process to the commercial trader's process, you can really start finding great stuff everywhere on your charts, can't you? You can find great stuff everywhere on your charts. And when you understand that, you can start to say, okay, well, well let's, get, let's get busy. I'm going to start looking for market makers activity at the bottom edges of the commercial buying phase. I'm going to be watching the time segmented volume. I'm going to be watching value. I'm going to start drawing some lines on my charts, and I'm going to make some great decisions. Okay, let's take a little break, guys. When we come back, we'll take three minutes break so we can get a triple in the, uh, into the uh, machine. We'll take three minutes break. When we come back, we'll just talk about where we are just now in, the, in, terms, of the, uh, in, terms, of the, uh, in terms of the last couple of days' uh, bond auctions. We'll show you where we are on the charts in terms of the bond auctions. Three minutes break.